Hi, welcome to another Retronaut video. So this video has been titled The Rescue. Why is it a rescue? Well, in the summer of uh, 2022, I was looking on eBay and uh, I'd been searching for an Amiga 4000 for quite a while at a price that actually made uh, sense. I was looking for um, a machine at actually a lot less uh, of a cost than the machine that I actually bought. But as I'll explain, you'll understand why it was quite a bit more expensive than that. So a young man in Worcester, uh, he was advertising what he was describing as the Amiga 4000 broadcast bundle. When I actually went down to get the machine, I discussed this with him and it turned out that it was actually, it was used in broadcast and it was used on a channel in the UK called ITV. And it's, that's one of the three original, uh, big original channels here. In different regions of the UK, you have different variations of ITV. So in Birmingham, which is the area that covers uh, where this guy was from, Worcester, the variation is called Central. And I actually used to watch this um, ITV when I was in college, because I was in college in Birmingham. So he said that what had happened was he was friendly with this guy, and I don't really know what happened, but the, um, the guy had unfortunately passed on, and he had uh, bequeathed his um, equipment to this young man. I think the young man was a, a trader uh, selling retro gear, but he basically didn't really seem to know what to do with it apart from to move it on. So I spoke to him. Oh yeah, this was after a massively long journey, by the way. I think from here to Worcester was about two and a half hours to get there and two and a half hours to get back, plus obviously the time uh, spent chatting to him. So um, I was talking to the young man and I asked him about the machine and he said that um, as far as he knew, it was working when it was given to him. He had powered it up and he found that it was giving him a black screen. However, that wasn't necessarily a sign of a disaster uh, because um, the machine actually was originally used with this thing here, which is called um, a G2 Systems um, image engine. Uh, this is actually the card, which is the heart of this um, setup that you see here. Uh, this is a, uh, an, a G2 Amiga image engine, issue two. Um, on the back of it, it does seem to have like sort of standard um, VGA-like outputs. But from what I understand, there is a cable that comes with this and you have to take the Amiga's output and then that goes maybe, it, where would it go? Well, I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's one of those um, cabling things. But basically, it looks like what it was designed to do was to use the Genlock capabilities of the Amiga to apply uh, graphics to video. And I have to assume that uh, this was used maybe for uh, news broadcasts or the weather or something like that. Really, I really don't know any details about what it was actually used for. This card has a lot of memory on it. These uh, chips here are all memory as far as I know. They're the same kind of memory I think that you had in the Amiga 3000. And it also has like a kind of normal SIM socket there as well. So it does seem to have an awful lot of RAM on it. And what I understand is that this RAM here is static RAM. And I think this is what you would call a frame store. So basically it's a card that you can put images onto. And when you turn the machine off and back on again, the images are actually stored in the card and you don't have to keep on reloading them all the time, which is pretty cool. I haven't tested it yet. There's a good reason for that because you'll see as we go on in this video, there was an, there was an issue with the Amiga 4000, which has taken quite a, a long time res to resolve. So I've had to write this down. There were so many things in this, um, what I call a hoard. Um, he called it a bundle, but I call it a hoard. So there was the Amiga 4000, um, and that was a 68040 Amiga 4000, so top of the range, which is really cool. Uh, it came with its keyboard, which in itself is pretty cool, because very often these days you'll see Amiga 4000s for sale and they don't have the keyboard. Honestly, people are gouging uh, basically on eBay and they sell the keyboard separately, and quite often they sell the keyboard for £350 plus. So you can see why I was lucky to actually get it as part of the bundle. And that kind of brought down the price of it, if you can imagine. It came with the uh, G2 Systems Image Engine Zora 2 card. This wasn't actually listed in his uh, listing, but there it is. That's, that's the card that was actually inside the machine. Then you have this breakout box here, which is part of this suite. Uh, then you have this uh, slider here with the legend on it, which I love actually. Um, yeah, fade to black. <laughs> 
Um, if you know uh, Metallica, then you'll know that's one of their songs. Yeah, Fade to Black. It also had a set of Commodore uh, speakers, uh, stereo speakers. This is just one of them. The other one actually has the power button on it and travel and bass control, so that's pretty cool. The other one has a little bit of damage on the grill, so that's a bit of a renovation project, and it's a little bit yellowed and beaten up as well. But I, I've got a feeling it'll probably work with a little bit of uh, TLC. Also came with an Amiga 500 uh, CD-ROM drive. What number is this? The A570. I was told by the young man that this didn't work. Um, I'm not sure if it's a problem with uh, the electronics inside, the mechanism for loading. Uh, there's also a power supply for this, a separate power su supply for this. So there's a lot of scope for a lot of different things um, not working on it. it um, so yeah, that's a, that's a future project to see if this works and tr try it out on an A500. Uh, so that would be pretty interesting. Also, it came with uh, a Sony PVM. I would assume that it would be a 15 inch, I think about this big. A PVM, by the way, is, um, uh, I think it's professional uh, video monitor. I think that's what it stands for, would make sense. It's basically uh, a broadcast quality video monitor that you would use in video production for TV and film. Uh, often they would be calibrated so that they would be very color accurate. So that in itself is a really cool monitor to have. Um, I, he did tell me that it wasn't working properly because there was a problem with, I think, green. Uh, maybe the green channel has a problem with, um, with capacitor. So that might be a fix either I can undertake, or possibly I could uh, sub that out to um, somebody in the community who's actually uh, got experience in uh, fixing monitors because it's a bit scary and it's not something I necessarily want to do. I think that might be worth investing in getting somebody else to actually do the fix on that. And maybe I could collaborate with another channel, a channel that does repairs, and maybe um, I could take it down to them and we could repair it. Um, and I could watch and make cooing noises as they, they do magical technical things. Uh, there were two more PVM monitors, um, and these were quite small ones. I suppose they were eight inch, maybe five inch? No, I think eight inch. Uh, two little PVMs in carry cases, aluminum, heavy duty carry cases. So I suppose you could uh, pair that up with an Amiga. Um, I actually have a Commodore 128D, which has got a carry handle. So I could actually use that with uh, one of these, uh, <laughs> these PVMs and uh, go to the local coffee shop and do some work there um, with my mobile computer. Anyway, I'm not sure if I'll keep those. I'm not sure if they're color. Uh, they may actually be uh, black and white, but that's something to check. Um, so yeah, the PVMs as well. What else was there? Two floppy disk drives, external. Um, so obviously this was quite the setup back in the day. And then the last two things, which I almost forgot, and they're not actually on my little list here, but I've just remembered them. There was uh, an old school oscilloscope, uh, you know, a, um, an actual physical oscilloscope, not uh, the kind of modern ones which use USB and so on and so forth. And there was a vector scope. So a vector scope, I, I don't really know what a vector scope is for, but I've got a, I, I can take an educated guess. Uh, if you think about colors coming out of one of these, then uh, the color might come out in, in three different signals, RGB, and they might have different strengths. And you can imagine that uh, you might want to adjust those RGB levels to be within broadcast limits. So yeah, really cool setup. Now, at the time that I acquired this stuff, I, this channel was a twinkle in my eye. I did have sort of ambitions to do it in the future. So I did take some videos. I must admit they're not very professional in terms of the quality. The sound, I didn't have the microphone at the time. So it's just recorded on my phone. Um, so it's a little bit jungle, but you know, um, I think it's actually quite cool that we watch the original videos so we can hear my uh, direct response to actually getting this machine home and uh, opening it up and having a look inside. So let me paint a picture for you. I find myself in Worcester. I've been chatting with this uh, young guy. I'm loading the stuff into the boot of my car and I'm thinking to myself, is this computer gonna be in working order? I drive off uh, from his house and I head towards the motorway and I start driving home. And I think by now it's about probably two o'clock in the afternoon, maybe three. And I've got um, pretty much a three hour uh, drive in front of me. By the time I get back to London, it's going to be rush hour. And obviously that means it's going to take longer to get back than it was to get there. Um, there's also likely to be more traffic on the motorway as the, as the journey progresses. And that's, that's actually the case. 
So yeah, I'm driving on the motorway and I'm thinking to myself, you know, what am I, what am I going to find when I open up this machine? Is it going to be in working order or is it going to be a disaster inside? So I had massive trepidation as I headed back home. I'll show you a picture here and uh, this will kind of help you to get the idea of what you can actually get when you get an Amiga 4000. These machines at some point were junk, right? Uh, people didn't value them anymore. They had no real utility as far as they were concerned. And very often they were put in uh, lofts and garages out of the way. They couldn't bear to obviously throw them away, but at the same time, they didn't necessarily keep them in very good environments. You can see in this particular model here, there's all kinds of nastiness on the case. You can see the fascia is pretty yellowed. So that's something that's obviously a common theme. They do tend to yellow. Oddly though, the, um, the power button doesn't seem to have yellowed as much. And that was, I think that was kind of the case with mine as well. This has got some kind of sticky plaster type business going on on the um, five and a quarter inch drive bay. I don't know why that is. It looks like the blanking plate for the bottom drive bay is just completely missing. And they've rather cunningly disguised it seamlessly with a piece of black duct tape. Mm, yeah. yeah. Anyway, let's have a look at the inside of this particular machine. And, you know, I was driving back and I was thinking to myself, am I going to find something like this? So let me point out to you here what, what the real disaster is. If you look at the red Varta battery, do you see all that white stuff on the, the PCB there? Well, that's electrolyte that's actually leaked out of the battery over time. And I don't know if you can see it there. If you look at the pins on the RAM to the right, you'll see they've got green on them. That's verdigris. That's copper rust. So that's a really bad sign. The electrolyte seems to have got up the pins of the chip socket and actually got onto the, uh, the pins of the RAM chips themselves. So that doesn't bode very well for this machine. If you look behind the uh, Varta battery, you can see the octal transceiver chip there. It's the very green one. That chip is crucial to the uh, chip RAM. And you can see that's very, very green. So the chances are that's, that's bought it. And then if you look to the left of the Varta battery, directly to the left, those chips there, they are involved in configuration and clock. And um, once you lose the clock in your machine, it's not going to work very well. Keep on going left and you'll see there's a screw to hold the, the logic board into the uh, case. That's really badly rusted and has got copper rust on it as well. And the worst thing is, and I think this shows you how bad this particular case is, if you look at the... Um, the joystick port, um, well, the right-hand one, I'm not sure if that's the most of the joystick port, but that's really badly rusted as well. So that shows you how far uh, the electrolyte can actually spread across the case. It depends obviously on the, the side which the case is resting on. Is it resting on its back? Is you seeing it here? Is it resting it on one side or on its front? It does tend not to be rested on its um, ports at the back. So I guess that's quite good really, because then it would go to the left in this picture and hit all those chips there. But even lying on its back, the uh, electrolyte can spread quite uh, widely and cause quite a lot of damage. So this is what I was thinking in my head, you know, what kind of machine am I going to get when I get back? Let's have a look at a case on my machine. This is when I actually put this down on my dining room table. I don't really have a good space right now for working on machines. Uh, my dining room table is about four foot wide and about eight foot long. Yeah, about eight foot long, maybe six foot long. So it's actually the best table I have actually for working on these things. And this is the machine. You can see that it's obviously very yellowed. If you look at the Commodore badge itself, that's what the fascia should match. And it should match the top of the machine and you can see it's not. And I don't know if you can see it on the picture there, but you see how the, the yellowing graduates as it goes to the right? That isn't a lighting effect. That's actually it getting more and more orangey yellow as you get to the right. We don't really see the right hand side, but that's actually the most orangey yellow part of the case, unfortunately. The power button, as I said earlier, that's actually not as yellowed. So yeah, there's definitely something about that that means that it does uh, resist the yellowing process a little bit better. And you can see that the disk drive actually appears to be un, uh, unyellowed. That's actually not true. Um, I'll explain that later in the video. But basically, once this was retrobrighted, it proved that those uh, two plastics actually were yellow. They just weren't as massively yellowed as the front of the case. So next we'll have a quick look at the video that I took. As I said, these were uh, recorded at the time when I didn't have a, a channel planned and I kind of recorded them just in case we got to this point. And I'm glad I did that because they kind of give you um, an insight to my kind of emotional state as I looked at this uh, machine that I just uh, bought for quite a lot of money um, and I wouldn't be able to return. Okay, I got the um, machine home today. Um, very long drive. The guy was very nice, Morgan, um, very helpful. And he tells me that the machine is not really working. There's no graphics. I'm very happy with the external condition of it. 
apart from the fact obviously that it's very very dirty but dirt can be cleaned up you know hopefully yeah looks like there's some kind of monitor marks on the top um, looking at the side ports there's hope that there's not too much battery damage because these actually look quite clean so yeah let's have a look inside and see what we can see okay so I've got the case off um, and I've taken out this card um, it appears to be some kind of graphics card I had hoped that it was a Picasso but it's not it's a G2 Amiga image engine issue 2 and I don't really know anything about this card um, there's a Texas Instrument chip there it seems to be quite a chunky monkey um, has some I think these might be I think these might be RAM uh, SIPs are they or something like that I can't remember um, it's a very sort of specific memory type from a very particular point in time and not that many stuff not that many things use it and then it has some other memory um, a normal sort of sim uh, which is quite interesting and then there are more Texas Instrument chips and then what appears to be some kind of connector really don't know what it is uh, the caps I think look okay um, but going over and looking at the machine itself the Amiga um, let's see where's the battery oh here we go um, let me see if I can get this to go into focus um, yeah there's a little bit of green there um, but I actually think it's relatively surface um, it's not gigantically crusty um, but the machine is from what I remember it's quite hard to take apart so I'm gonna have to take out the hard disk I think and take off the front or something like that um, to get basically what I want to do is to get so that I can get to this side of this uh, battery and this side coming in from here so I can get it from both directions so I can actually get in and clip and remove it um, yeah that's what I'm trying to do uh, to do that I need to obviously disassemble the machine and what I'm going to try and do is actually put vinegar on it and neutralize it and then uh, maybe try tomorrow actually powering up and seeing if it does anything the seller told me that they couldn't get any image from it but they were using quite a high-end setup and I think they might have been using this card as possible this card isn't working so what I'll try doing is I'll plug in the RGB connector on the back and see if we can get something from that I got the motherboard out of the case I have to say um, here's a quick note to Commodore back in the when would it have been 1991 something like that you really should have made a better effort to make this machine easy to service because my god it's designed not to be serviced that's the way I would uh, say um, so over here underneath that jumble there's the front panel that was the first thing there are these clips um, which are located basically down here uh, there there will be a clip which you can't get to and you have to squeeze it and uh, so that's very very difficult um, once you get the front cover off then you've got screws on the motherboard um, like for instance there's one under there under the slots right under the Zorro slots not here or anything where it'd be easy to get to no it's under the Zorro slots even worse on this side here there's one there uh, which is basically again underneath the daughter card for the CPU which is great um, and then the worst one was this screw hole here um, actually you can't see that there we go that screw hole there and that one is behind a piece of metalwork so you have to kind of get into a, what looks like it to be like a ventilation grill and with a very thin screwdriver and then grip it with some pliers because obviously it's going to be rusted and then snap it and then turn it and get it out so yeah it's just plus absolutely covered in extremely difficult um, things to remove um, and all of this of course is so that I can get in here so let's just pause here for a second I just want to point out a few things to you here if you look at the Varta battery there the big red bulbous death machine you'll see that it actually looks pretty sparkly and in fact the uh, mounting brackets for it look pretty good as well but if you look at the base of the battery you'll see that there is actually some green corrosion going on there also to the left of it you'll see that chip there the pins on the right hand side of it look pretty dull as do the resistors at the bottom of the screen do you see the row there of resistors I think there's eight of them all in a row you'll see that some of them look pretty dull especially the ones further to the right 
and the ones to the left actually seem to have some copper uh, rust coming off them. You can see that in green. The rest of those three chips above them, which are pretty critical, they actually don't look too bad, especially on the left-hand side. You see how on the left-hand side the pins are actually picking up the light a bit? And that shows that the corrosion on that side doesn't actually look too bad. Right now we can't really see much more from this position, but again, I want to point out the top of the screen. I don't know if you can see it there. It's um, the 74F245 chip. That's called an octal transceiver, and it's actually used as part of the fast RAM and uh, there are several of these actually in the in the uh, logic board. And if you look at the pins on that, and you'll see some fires right next to it, you see those little round rings? Do you see how they're very green? That's, that's not good. Yeah, it looks like the battery really gave that chip in particular uh, a bit of a roasting. So anyway, let's um, unpause and carry on and hear what uh, past Chris had to say about this. To the um, beloved battery which is, uh, yeah, of course it's a Varta. Now, to be fair, everybody, you know, gives them a bit of a hard time Varta, but, you know, they make the batteries. They don't necessarily weld them into machines and then leave them in a cupboard for 20, 30 years. This one seems to have leaked up here a bit. Can you see some there? There's some rust there and there's some rust there. So this one seems to have been lying on its side, I think, with this being down and the the contents of the battery has gone in this direction. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I can't get the daughter card out, um, the Zorro slot card, and I think that's because it's basically uh, rusted in. Uh, and I've put some deoxide along the slot, but I'm going to leave it overnight to soak in. I don't really want to give it a lot of stress, so I'm going to take it out tomorrow. Um, and what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to use white vinegar, and I've got a toothbrush here somewhere, and I'm basically just going to scrub this very lightly around here to neutralize the, the stuff that I can see there. And then I'm just going to wash it off with some alcohol. I'm also going to cut this out as carefully as I can. Um, and then I'm going to leave it for tomorrow, a bit of daylight, a uh, bit of me time on the weekend, um, which will then allow me hopefully to take out the daughter card. And then the other thing I need to do is to take out the CPU card and have a look under there because it, as you can see the trail goes in this direction um it's a fluid so there's a good chance that it's gone through the zorro connector hopefully it's not damaged the zorro connector too much apart from here right next to the battery it doesn't look super 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 crusty so i'm hoping that the battery's only started to leak relatively recently and there's not too much damage but time will tell anyway i'm going to turn off the video and i'm going to give it a bit of a clean Okay, so was the rescue mission a success? When I called it a rescue mission, it's at no disrespect to, I think it was Morgan, the guy who had the uh, computer uh, who sold it to me. I wasn't rescuing it from him. I was actually rescuing it from itself because obviously, the as we saw earlier, the battery damage in Amiga 4000s can be really substantial. The Varta battery starts leaking and... Um, <laughs> The machine's own juices actually start to uh, basically dissolve it internally. And uh, Morgan wasn't really aware of that, so that's what the rescue was. Was it successful? Well, it's not successful yet. At this point in time, the machine is not necessarily working. We don't really know if it's working or not. He has told us already that he thinks it's not working. So we definitely seem to have our work cut out for us. The front of the machine is very oranged in a gradiated manner from uh, its, its uh, left-hand side to its right-hand side, so that's a bit of an issue. The floppy drive doesn't look too bad, and the button itself, um, the power button, doesn't look too bad either. So I think in terms of retrobriting, it's a challenge, definitely, but I think the Uvinator can uh, rise to the challenge, and uh, with a little bit of careful planning and execution, we should hopefully get a good result. And if you look on the desk in front of you, you can see that... Um, that's pretty much what we got in the end. Uh, this is the button. Uh, I should show it to you. It's a rather uh, crazy little design. The button is on the front of the machine. Then there's a very long plastic arm that goes back to the power uh, unit. And uh, that's where the actual power button is. And this pushes it. So um, obviously, this is a pretty crucial piece of the machine. And you definitely don't want to break one of these. It's only this little piece of it here that actually sticks out and gets yellowed. And although in that video, uh, earlier, it didn't really look like this was yellowed. It, it still actually was yellowed, um, especially when it was compared to the uh, the fascia of the machine when I'd finished retrobriting it. 
The uh, floppy drive actually was yellowed as well. I'll point out to you that I couldn't really do anything on the, uh, the eject button, and that's because it's actually glued to the mechanism. And uh, I'd rather have a working floppy drive than a floppy drive that looks perfect, so uh, I didn't try to wrestle that off, I just left it where it was and uh, took the hit in terms of the, the aesthetics. So uh, yeah, so in the next video, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the, uh, the refurbishment of the machine, which is probably the, the easiest part of it, actually. Um, although, you know, it can be fraught with certain issues, you can over retro bright things definitely. And, um, you know, it, in this case, I think I was very lucky because the actual machine itself, the physical machine, uh, the plastics, nothing was broken at all. Nothing was massively scratched. So that's a really good start. Um, unfortunately, the fascia, as we saw, was very yellowed and it was very unevenly yellowed. So that's something we're gonna have to be very careful of in the next video. So yeah, my mad dash over to Worcester, uh, I think has been a, a partial success and we'll, we'll see in the next few videos whether it was a full uh, and complete success. Obviously the main problem would be if we can't get the Amiga 4000 working because if we can't get that working, then the vast majority of the value in the bundle um, has just gone you know, down the tubes. I hope you enjoyed this video and if you did, please uh, click on the like button. And obviously if you can subscribe to the channel as well because that will help it to grow um, you'll get uh, notifications when I produce new videos and obviously liking the video will help it uh, be promoted to other people who have got a uh, similar interest to yourself. I hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next one where we start refurbishing this machine. See you later.